Well, if you could uh, take your seats, I'd like to uh, welcome you this morning to the future of media in children's education, a focus on tweens. Uh, my name is Ted Lempert, the president of Children Now, and I'm uh, so excited to be in this uh, amazing facility and so excited to see all of you here today. Um, really, I have uh, three reasons for my uh, enthusiasm about uh, today's conference. Two are personal and, and one is professional. Uh, first, as a uh, Princeton and Stanford grad, I think it's sort of cool that Stanford is hosting a conference that is co-sponsored uh, by Princeton. And we were a little nervous at first about it, whether that was awkward at all, but we checked the sports schedules and there don't seem to be any major uh, rivalries in the next few months. So we think that's, uh, we think that's safe. Um, uh, the second personal reason is I'm the parent of three kids, inclu including two tweens. Um, so I have a significant personal interest in what we're going to be uh, talking about today. And, and I've watched in, a, in awe, essentially, at, at my kids' facilities with technology. Um, as uh, others their age, they're always wired always multitasking, and I think from the, the moment they learned how to read, when they had a question, they Googled it. And I've seen them do amazing creative work uh, with technology outside of their homework and their school projects um, in very, some very cool movie productions that they just you know, worked on and, and made themselves over um, some weekends. I've also heard them complain about how they are not allowed to have any technology in their classrooms, such as a cell phone or laptop, and they complain because they're lugging around backpacks that literally weigh over 50 pounds with their required uh, textbooks. Um, and if you're wondering, uh, in my kids' public schools, like many these days, they don't have lockers. Uh, they also don't have lockers for PE, but that's for another uh, conference on school funding in California. Um, but the third reason and most important reason I'm excited about today is as President of Children Now, we're so uh, uh, honored to co-host this event with the future of, of children in Brookings and Princeton. Uh, children Now is a 20-year history of leadership on cutting-edge issues involving children in the media, uh, from the V-chip to the Door of the Explorer character to the uh, Federal Communications Commission's ruling in 2004 ensuring expanded access to educational and informational programming. Um, at Children Now, we view children in the media issues with a provide and a protect frame, uh, protecting children from the negative impacts of media, uh, it's, uh, it's such as uh, the efforts with the V-chip and trying to curb junk food advertising in an effort to stem the obesity crisis. Um, but we also uh, focus on the positive of media, and today focuses on that provide frame how can media be used to engage and better educate tweens and also make them healthier? How can media be used to excite young people about learning while at home, at school, after school programs? Um, this is a critical issue uh, for the future uh, of our country, our democracy, and our economy. Uh, we all have a stake in ensuring that all our kids are well educated and have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Yet one of the key issues affecting our educational system today, um, in addition to funding and, and lack of some significant reforms, is that many students are failing to understand the relevance of school. It, believe it or not, many start tuning off to school in the middle school and high school years because they're not seeing the connection between what they're learning in the classroom and the world they see outside of school. I was in a meeting recently with uh, George Miller, who heads the Education Labor Committee uh, in, in the House of Representatives, and, and he made an interesting point about how our children today live in two separate worlds. One is the world of technology, where, like my kids, they're wired all day, they're on cell phones, iPods, computers, nonstop. That's the world they live in, except when they get into this classroom, where their facilities, curriculum, and schedule have more in common with the agrarian and industrial ages than today's technological age. Now, there are, of course, some exceptions to that. And we have exceptions right here in this room. We are so thrilled today to have speakers and experts from a range of fields to share with us what they know about media's potential to educate. So we can see examples of how professionals in the field use media to engage tweens and to learn about policy steps needed to ensure access to media that positively impacts children's educational development. Um, and just as we have some uh, great speakers lined up today, we have rich expertise uh, throughout the room. Teachers, school administrators, technology officers, professors, foundation officers, people in charge of educational initiatives and after-school programs and museums, advocates and representatives from the entertainment and technology industries. 
It will take all of these sectors working together uh, to address some of the real barriers that exist in effectively incorporating media as an educational tool in both home and school environments. Um, so before I uh, bring up one of our co-hosts here, I do want to uh, acknowledge just a few folks from uh, uh, children now from our board of directors. Our board president, um, Jane Gardner, is here. Our board vice chair, Pete Buley, and uh, Gay Krause, our board member who will be on the panel a little bit later, so please get to know uh, them as well. And I will be introducing our, our uh, uh, staff uh, throughout the day, um, but all of us are, are very excited about working with all of you um, to really ensure that media can play a positive role in children's educational and healthy development. Um, so I'm now uh, honored to uh, introduce uh, one of the co-hosts who uh, made a, a trip out here to help organize this and be with us this morning, Elizabeth Donahue, the Executive Director of the Future of Children. She manages all aspects of the journal, including uh, fundraising and outreach activities and, and organizing uh, conferences like this one. Um, in addition to the volume you're taking home today, and I hope you all got one when you signed in, and, and make sure to, if not, to, to take it during the day, she has co-edited two other volumes, uh, Marriage and Child Well-Being and Childhood Obesity. Um, at Children Now, uh, we have, have come to uh, rely a lot on uh, Elizabeth's scholarship and, and the journal to help guide us in her leadership leadership on making children a priority in this country. Uh, so it's an honor to uh, bring up Elizabeth on here to uh, welcome you and to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, and thank you to Children Now for um, co-sponsoring this. This really, this, the idea for this conference started before the journal was even written. <laughs> so um, the idea for doing a conference uh, in collaboration with Children Now has been long in the making, so I'm thrilled that it's actually come to pass. Um, so I'm here today to give a brief overview of the findings from the Future of Children volume on children and electronic media, and to tell you a little bit about the future of children and really what the motivation for this volume was. Um, as for those who are not familiar with our journal, we're a collaboration between Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School and the DC-based Brookings Institution. And the core mission of the future of children is to translate the best social science research about children and youth into information that is useful to policymakers and practitioners and to disseminate our findings broadly. So events like this are terrific for the future of children because we certainly don't want to be stuck in the ivory tower, even though we're at Stanford. Um, so you can go online and see our materials, but in essence, the project publishes two journals and policy briefs a year. We have a lot of short summaries of our work. We have an active website, and um, we host a range of outreach projects such as this. Um, one of the things that we're committed to is we provide all our materials at no charge, um, which many on the web do, but most scholarly journals don't. And so that is one of our goals, and with the help of foundations such as the MacArthur Foundation, that funded this volume. It's really important that we reach a broad audience with our findings. Um, we cover a lot of topics. We range from income policy to family issues to education and health, with children and youth as the unifying element. Um, and when we're choosing our topics, we like to aim for those that resonate with parents and educators and policymakers. And clearly, electronic media used by children and youth is a compelling issue. As anyone who spends time with young people knows, children and youth spend a huge amount of time with electronic media. One of the facts in the journal is that kids spend more time with media than any other ac single activity other than sleeping, <laughs> six or more hours a day for the average eight to 18 year old. As you all know, media has saturated the home. The typical eight to 18 year old lives in a household with three televisions, three video players, three radios, three iPods or other MP3 devices, two video game consoles, and a personal computer. Television has not gone away, it is still dominant. It's simply been joined by other media, not crowded out by it. Again, as you all know, multitasking is at an all-time high, despite the finding that many of you must have seen the report a couple weeks ago that multitasking actually makes for poor decision making. But regardless, it's at an all-time high. 81% of kids use more than one media at a time with the computer uh, dubbed to the media multitasking station by one of our authors. This makes measurement of media exposure difficult because typical time use diaries tend to ask about overall use, the total time using media, rather than breaking the use down into types of media. For kids, of course, convergence is the key element to how media is used, where one type of platform can be used as another. My favorite is watching a movie on an iPod, which 
seems really hard <laughs> with the little tiny screen. But my three children managed to do it on car rides. And of course, with convergence comes portability. Kids, mostly teens and tweens, can take their media with them where there's no oversight by parents or teachers. Now, all of these trends have produced a lot of hand-wringing by parents and teachers, including myself. I have three video game-obsessed sons who really, truly are the inspiration for this volume. Uh, <laughs> the whole time it was going on, they kept saying to me, is it good? Did you find out it's good or is it bad and you're going to take it all away? <laughs> so, um, so with the lead editor of the volume, Jeannie Brooks Gunn, I set out to find the reality about what we know about media's effects on teens and children. Um, so we know that kids consume a lot of media, that's clear. The response to that should be, so what? Should we be concerned? And the answer we came to in the volume is, sort of unhelpfully perhaps, it depends. It depends on the content, not the media platform used or even time spent using it. This is tricky, of course, because regulating content is much harder than regulating the particular media platform or even time spent using media. In the household, it is virtually impossible to wade through all the content that comes in your door or over the internet or through the air. So the natural default for parents who want to limit use is to put time limits down without spending as much time monitoring content and guilty as charged. Uh, for the government, the First Amendment makes regulation of content almost impossible. And thus, regulation tends to take the form of rules about the medium itself, be chips and television or parental controls on computers, for example. But at the end of the day, we know it's content matters. And with content matters as the takeaway, the overall conclusion of the volume is that Marshall McLuhan had it wrong when he said the medium is the message. Rather, the message is the message. And this finding informs this conference and all that we know about electronic media and helps us worry a little bit less because if we can get the content right, the media does not have to be harmful. In fact, it can be downright beneficial for kids. We have many examples of how children and youth learn from their own personal use of media, which will be explored today. The challenge, of course, is to convince youth that media that promotes well-being is as interesting as that that promotes unhealthy choices or excessive violence or inappropriate sexual content. So we have to be creative. Moreover, if implemented correctly, media use in the classroom can also be beneficial. But as with personal use, there are caveats. The teacher needs to have a comfort level with the media. So it should be embraced by the teacher, not forced on him or her. Media must be integrated with curriculum. In other words, curriculum needs to drive the technology and not the other way around. Resources are required to support the media. You can't have access to a fabulous website if you don't have computers that can access that information. And of course, technical and curriculum support must be provided at all times. But even with the challenges and caveats, the potential to use electronic media to educate our youth in leisure time and in school time is immense. We will hear today about all the positive ways that media can influence kids with a focus on tweens. And to start this amazing day, you will first hear from Milton Chen. Milton Chen is the executive director of the George Lucas Educational Foundation Prior to, to joining the foundation in 1998, Chen was the founding director of PBS's KQED Center for Education in San Francisco, managing the channels, the te channel, channels television programming, web content, and outreach services for schools and families. He has been a director of research at Sesame Workshop in New York, working on Sesame Street, The Electric Company, and my personal favorite, 321 Contact. His work has been honored by recognition from the Congressional Black Caucus, and he has received the Sesame Workshop's Elmo Award, which, I mean, that beats an Emmy, <laughs> and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's Fred Rogers Award. Chen received a bachelor's degree in social studies from Harvard University and a doctorate degree in communication research from Stanford University. His work is truly impressive, and I encourage you to look at the longer bio in your folders. I know I speak for all of us, children now and future of children, when I say that we are thrilled that he's here today to give the keynote address. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I must say I'm very pleased to see so many people, as we now say, of a certain age here. Uh, since it's, since it's early in the morning, let's just do a quick little poll. How many of you are in your 20s? 
Well, there are a few people. All right. There's a few people in your 20s, maybe less than 10. And how many people are, are in your 30s? Oh, well, this is, this is very impressive. People in the, most of the people, that's about half, are in your 30s. That's great. Uh, and as we move up the uh, chronological ladder, how many of you are uh, in your 40s? Oh, see, that's great. That's great. And, and now, now for my group, how many of you are over 50? Yeah, all right. Some of you, like, voted twice. I was like... Uh, how many of you are over 60? There you go. Because uh, I think one of my messages today is that age doesn't matter anymore. That this new age of technology that we're talking about is redefining age. And it's going to be more about what you know and can do. And this focus today on tweens is so important because I really believe today's tweens are the ones that are showing us what is now possible. In many ways, today's tweens are the old teens. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our digital generation project in which we made 10 multimedia portraits of digital youth. Uh, we thought they would be roughly between the ages of 8 and 18. They're between the ages of 9 and 18. Uh, but one of the great learnings for us at the Lucas Foundation in talking with kids and having many kids send in, we call them little audition tapes, on YouTube, if you want to be part of this digital generation project, we'll come out and, and tape you in your natural habitat, going to school, in your homes. Uh, send us a little two-minute video of yourselves on YouTube. We never could do that before until recently, and uh, we learned a lot. But what we learned most importantly was that these kids, between the ages roughly of 10 to 13, 9 to 12, 8 to 12, these are the kids to really keep your eyes on because they were doing things that we thought older kids were doing. Uh, but it's these kids, and I'll show you a couple of them soon, are really defining what it means to be a child, what it means to be an adolescent, all those old age categories, you know, preschool, or early primary grades, middle school, high school, beyond, adolescence, adulthood, all that's changing as we move into this age. And uh, I think it's a very exciting time. I, I see that I neglected to put a title for my keynote address. But if, if I were to pick a title, it would be something like, it's a great time to be a tween. Uh, and I say that because we are in the midst, in case you haven't noticed, of a tremendous moment in history. Uh, while we tend to think of these new tools as something that have come about in the last five, ten years, maybe fifteen years, uh, when I was doing my graduate work here at Stanford, oh, a few years ago, maybe twenty, more than twenty, uh, we were studying this little device called the microcomputer. We called it the microcomputer at the time. Um, but this is really a centuries old development. Many of these ideas and issues are not new. Uh, but I simply refer you to uh, Clay Shirky's talk, uh, TED Talk. How many of you have seen TED Talks? Most of you have. Uh, just, just Google Clay Shirky, S-H-I-R-K-Y, and TED, which stands for Ted Lempert, but also stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design, the TED Conference uh, every year in Monterey. Clay is a professor at NYU of interactive media, and in those TED Talks, which, what are they, 14 minutes, 17 minutes, you will learn more about this historical time that we're in. He takes you back to the age of Gutenberg. He talks about how most of us here grew up in the age of broadcast, where we're the television generation, right? And we remember when there was this large box in your living room, and you would sit on the couch. And some of us are of the age you actually remember getting up off the couch to go to that box and change the channel. And then you'd go back and sit on the couch. Well, we were raised in that age, and, and Shirky says, now we're in another age. It is as significant as, as the Gutenberg Bible. It is as significant as the birth of television in the 40s, 50s. And it's great that we're alive to see it because this is going to change the world and change education and change families and schools over the next horizon, the next 50 years, uh, in ways that we can only now imagine. Basically, he talks about moving from a one-to-many, the broadcast model, one-to-many, to a many-to-many -many world, the network world, and everything that will mean for today's topic of, of education. 
while you're there, uh, take a look at Ken Robinson's uh, TED Talk, uh, one of the most popular TED Talks. Ken is an arts educator from England. How many of you have heard of Ken Robinson? All right, this is good. Ken is not paying me enough to promote him. <laughs> Ken has a new book out called The Element. What he means by the element is a kid's passion that our job as people who care about education should be to help kids find their passion, that element that animates them. Uh, but he's got a great TED Talk, and Ken talks about how our schools for many generations now have been strip mining, as he calls it, our children's minds. We talk about a lot of environmental waste. Uh, we have been responsible for a lot of human waste. We have wasted a lot of our children's youth, we have not given them the kinds of resources, experiences, conditions that they really need to grow and develop. He uses that great metaphor of every child, think of the agricultural model. Every child's a seed. And in, in, I'm not a farmer, but I understand that when you go out and farm, you buy a bunch of seeds and you put them in the ground, and your job as farmer is to make sure that the soil, the light, the heat, the nutrients are there to make that seed grow that those seeds are basically all, all have the same ingredients needed to grow. And your job as the farmer is to help them grow in this kind of environment that you've provided. And Ken Robinson says we haven't provided that environment for so many kids. We've thrown these seeds out there on barren rock. We haven't allowed them to develop. We've wasted a lot of lives. Um, I'm so glad that Ted is here because I know of his leadership on children's issues going back many years to his work in the State Assembly. Here in California, you know when we're wasting children's lives, we're paying for it at the other end. The California prison system is a great system to be part of if you're building prisons, if you're training to be a prison guard. This is the growth industry. Uh, we have not invested in our schools, but we've invested, therefore, in a lot of prisons where kids who have not been given the right environment are now costing us more than $40,000 a year in the state prison system. Note to those of you who are parents with kids in college, that's enough to send a kid to Stanford. So we're paying for kids who have not been given the right kinds of experiences. But those are some great, uh, great talks on TED. Um, it'll shift your thinking, and I sometimes feel when I go around and give talks, all I'm doing is, is a web page with links. I'm just going to tell you, go to this site, look at this, listen to Clay Shirky, listen to Ken Robinson, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what's on our website with the digital generation. Just a final thought before we, we turn to our digital generation port portraits. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see this audience, which is an audience of a certain age, interested in this new generation and the digital tools for learning. There are many people like us of a certain age who are not that interested in embracing the new digital tools. And in fact, many of them run our school systems. Uh, I was, uh, you know, you're familiar with this phrase, the digital natives and the digital immigrants. You know, we're all digital immigrants. We're, we're television kids. And we've come to this, this new digital age trying to adjust to this new land. We speak this language with an accent. Uh, we're not quite comfortable in the digital age. And then there are the digital natives, the tweens, the teens, who have grown up digital. They were born digital. Uh, I, I was once making this comparison to a group of superintendents in Texas who, in fact, are digital superintendents. They're interested in how do you harness the, this, this new age of the Internet for learning. And um, I said, you know, the definition of a digital immigrant uh, is someone who prints out their email in order to read it. <laughs> how many of you do that? How many of you? Have, I, I confess to that, so we don't have too many digital immigrants. And... Uh, one of the superintendents in Texas said, you know, I have a colleague, and uh, he actually gets his assistant to print out his email so he can read it. And one of the other superintendents said, that's not a digital immigrant, that's a digital idiot. <laughs> that's someone who is so far lost in this world, he will never find his way. And you can imagine those kinds of digital immigrants running our school systems to whom this is all very scary stuff. Of course, there is a dark side to the new media. Working for George Lucas, I understand the attraction of the dark side. It's there, and boy, it is scary. 
So we're here to talk about the light side. We're here to talk about what can we do to make sure that this new environment, these new tools, can be used for really powerful learning. Uh, I'm a devotee of Seymour Papert, and I will remind you that Seymour Papert said, this technology can be wheels for the mind. This can help accelerate our children's learning in ways, again, that we cannot even imagine. I've always believed that, and um, in creating these portraits of digital youth, uh, we see many, many examples of that. So if we could, uh, let's go to uh, a quick example, an overview documentary we created of these 10 uh, digital youth. This is the digital generation. I text more than I call people, like no one calls anyone anymore. My iPod is like my entire life. A generation of kids raised in a media-rich, networked world of infinite possibilities. A lot of my movies, there's special effects, things that you really couldn't do in real life. They are learning, communicating, and socializing in new and exciting ways. I'm showing video to the other people that are in the meeting to get them to help review. For them, technology is more than a tool. It's an essential component of everyday life that frames their worldview. These are all different people in need in Haiti and took on one of these families to learn more. But there's more to their world than just playing with cool gadgets. It's about engagement. Okay, guys, join self-directed learning. It's not just animation. You need to know a lot of different things like biology to see how things move. Creativity. This is my avatar as she typically will look. And empowerment. Do you think there can be people that would try and hurt you on a website? I'm teaching young elementary kids how to stay safe online. They're hyper-connected to their friends and family, mastering new tools and techniques with ease. I like this because it's competitive and it's really using strategy in your mind. For those kids who will become leaders of guilds in World of Warcraft, that's as much an experience as being the captain of the football team, being the editor of the school newspaper. Behind every successful kid are adults and peers who guide, motivate, and support them. Kids on their own are jumping across from all these different mediums, so we really need to kind of explore all of them as well and try to support kids to become better producers and consumers. Did you put sound in this? It's annoying. I don't like it anymore. Very rarely do kids look at instruction manuals these days. They are empowered to just go out and learn. And if I'm a parent and I'm wondering, wow, how do I provide the technology resources for my children? Just get out of their way. <laughs> hey, this digital life, it's a good thing. It's going to help your kids create meet people, explore, compose, express themselves. They have more powerful tools than they've ever had in any generation in history. This is the digital generation. Welcome to their world. Great. So that's a little overview of this project. And uh, yeah, this is our uh, website. Uh, For more information about... <laughs> Thank you, Peter Coyote. Uh, how many of you are watching the Ken Burns series on the national parks? PBS, 
12 hours on the history of the national parks. Uh, and again, for those of you who are involved with schools and, and young people, it's a great resource for learning about our nation's history. But Peter Coyote, our Bay Area actor and narrator, narrates that series for Ken Burns and also uh, did some work for us. He's a tremendously uh, philanthropic actor who will do just about any narration for any uh, nonprofit. Uh, he sets time, to, time every week to do that. So this is our digital generation site, and you'll see that there are, so that this little video here, when you enter your kid's digital world is what you just saw. Um, and then we made 10 portraits of these kids, and I'll just run you through a couple of them. But uh, you can note their ages, and uh, here are some who are just on the brink of being a tween. Um, one of the things we learned about these kids is that while they're using digital tools and digital media, they're all doing it within the context of their own lives. They're kind of situating it within their own locale, their community, their family situation. Uh, Virginia is one example of a girl. She's 14. You saw a quick clip of her there. Who uh, comes from rural Georgia. Uh, she's quite a religious uh, teenager. And she found that she was spending four hours a day on Facebook. And she said, this is not good. I'm going to give it up for Lent. Uh, and you saw her also then playing the role of teacher. She's teaching younger kids. At the age of 14, she's teaching, as, what does she call them, those younger elementary school kids who are only like five years younger than I am, uh, about internet safety. Um, Jalen is 12 from Chicago. He's involved with Nicole Pinkard's um, digital youth network. Uh, Bridget Barron, I don't, know, I don't know if Bridget's here. At Stanford is doing the research and evaluation of uh, this project in, in Chicago and has also created some ethnobiographies of these kids. You can tell I don't speak PC here. I'm a Mac, I'm not a PC. Um, well, sorry, I'll keep going. So we also learned that these kids are, are producing. Jalen's a good example of a kid who's producing There we go. Producing content, not just consuming content. Of course, this is the amazing thing. And in Clay Shirky's talk, he talks about the importance now of the internet subsuming all previous media. As he says, every medium on the internet that we've known, television, radio, photography, music, books, every medium is now right next to every other medium on the internet. It's right next to every other medium on this little device right here, right? You can read a book. You can listen to music. You can look at fo photographs. You can take photographs. You can create media. So this is a real change now where kids can produce as well as consume. That's an, um, another important finding from these portraits. Uh, Sam, I th uh, there was a little clip about her, uh, plays World of Warcraft. So this is another thing we wanted to show that these video games, these action video games, are not just the province of young males, but if the right games were created, young girls would start to, to play them as well. So Sam, living out there in DeKalb, Illinois, about three hours west of Chicago, um, loves to play World of Warcraft and also loves to teach. So I just wanted to point out a couple of other themes from this work. And huh, help me. There they are. We tried to summarize some of the cross cutting themes and looking at these 10 portraits. I've mentioned one of them kids are creating as well as receiving content now. They're collaborating in new ways. I think this is nothing new to you. But this teaching function, I wanted to emphasize um, the change of roles for young children what it means to be a student. If you say the word student, that means you're sitting, listening to someone speaking. You're supposed to absorb what that person is saying. Uh, but these kids can now teach. And I think that's the change we want to make. You see numerous examples in these portraits of kids who are teaching younger kids, 
teaching their parents, teaching their teachers, um, or teaching their teachers how to use technology. One of my favorite projects that's been around for a long time, funded by the U.S. Department of Education, is the Generation Yes Project. It does and has placed kids in the role of teaching assistance to their teachers around technology. And on our site, we've profiled this. There are kids as young as the fourth grade who are now kind of the new version of the AV crew. They come in and set up technology for their teachers. They help their teachers understand what could be done, take the teacher's lecture notes and turn them into PowerPoints. Find the five best sites for teaching about the Civil War. Why is it in this change we're trying to create digital age schools, we put so much of the burden on teachers themselves? This is not going to work and has not worked for the past 20 years. We need to create other roles within schools, and importantly, the other 97% of stakeholders in our schools who are the students themselves. We need to give them new roles, new responsibilities. It can happen with tweens. It can happen with even younger kids if we just give them uh, these roles. I will point out in all this discussion about the stimulus bill and the new funding for the U.S. Department of Education, Generation Yes is the only we believe the only technology challenge grant from about 10, 12 years ago that is still doing the work. You know how grants come and go and projects end? Well, Generation Yes has really got a track record of doing this, and there's no better time to create this new role for students uh, with uh, really serving as teachers uh, than to use some of the stimulus funding that's coming through to give these students this new role. Just a couple of other quick themes uh, that we distilled from these portraits. One is the nature of global learning, that these kids, these tweens, are global learners. They think nothing more of just setting up a little video conference, talking with kids in other countries. Uh, Dylan, this kid from New Hampshire, was 13, part of a ThinkQuest team, where he collaborates with kids around the world. Never met, but they collaborate making the most amazing websites. Uh, so go to thinkquest.org, I believe, for that project. Um, but there are so many examples throughout these porches of kids who are just connecting with kids in other countries. Um, you have them in your homes now. These used to be amazing stories, but now we hear them everywhere. Uh, on our staff, we have a woman, uh, Lori Chu, who's one of our web developers. Um, we were describing a project. That's a little too inside, but George Lucas came back from the Venice Film Festival. He said, do you know the director of the Venice Film Festival speaks seven languages? And our guide speaks three languages and is learning Chinese. And wouldn't it be great if we could find a project where American kids were using the internet to talk with kids in Italy, say for an hour. The American kids are, will be speaking in English and the Italian kids are trying to learn English. The American kids would be teaching the Italian kids. And for the second half hour, the Italian kids would speak in Italian and help the American kids learn Italian. Sounds amazing, right? So we're at a staff meeting and we're describing this and Lori says, my kids are doing that. My kids studied uh, Italian for a year, and now there are a number of these projects, uh, I'm sure many of you are involved with them, where you can connect up American kids with kids around the world to do this kind of exchange live via the internet, through text, correcting wit written work as well. Again, being teacher and learner, and in a global context. And the last point I'd like to leave you with is the role of adults. That's us. Because in these conversations, there is this sense that somehow these kids are doing this on their own. They are born digital. They immediately grasp at the age of 18 months how to operate this little device right here. Uh, but in fact, based on what we saw, the role of parents, the role of teachers becomes even more important. What we as adults have done for these kids is, again, what I was talking about, Ken Robinson, sowing the seeds. We've created these environments. We've created the fertile ground on which these kids can do this work. Most of these kids were born into families where their parents said, we think this is important somehow. We think it's important that our kids learn these digital skills. We're going to provide them with a laptop from an early age. One of my favorite kids is Cameron from Indiana. He's 11. And you see a little photo of him with, at the age of three. His little fingers on the laptop. His parents have made that possible for him. So eight years later, he does things like create visual effects in his own garage with a green screen. This goes back to that point about situating the, these digital tools and learning within your own lives. In rural Indiana, he plays hockey. So he's thinking about, how would I apply this new digital tool? I'll do a video analysis of my slap shot. I want to get better at hockey. 
I can use this digital camera and what I know about green screen, putting up green poster boards in his garage, doing it at 6 a.m. His parents are waking up. They hear Cameron moving the furniture around, the boxes in the garage, so he can stand there with his hockey stick and repeatedly hit his slap shot and video himself, slow it down, and analyze his performance. It's a great metaphor for learning. He's doing it in the context of sports. But these adults have made these experiences possible. Uh, it's so important that we now think about creating the policies, creating the experiences in the classroom, in after-school programs, wherever we can meet kids on their ground. Uh, it's so important to close the digital divide which persists. And one of the girls in our uh, program here uh, is in San Francisco, uh, has never had her own laptop, but uses public access computers public libraries, uh, public housing, to stay in touch with her friends on Facebook. Uh, and I'll just close with an example from Luis in Oregon. He's now 18. Uh, he's doing some amazing work with technology. He's part of a 4-H program, an after-school program, which has enabled him to do service learning. He and his colleagues, his fellow students, teachers in 4-H, um, do a street tree inventory. I said, when he first said that to me, I said, what did you just say? He said, we're doing a street tree inventory. I said, what is that? He said, a street tree inventory is done for the city, I can't remember the name, of Cornelius, Oregon. Cities own a lot of property and have a lot of trees. This is very important for the environment, but they don't have the staff to run around and monitor the health of these trees. So they hire these kids from 4-H to do it. They train them, arborists train them to look at a tree, identify the tree, identify the health of this tree, take out their little handheld devices, which are GPS enabled, um, log the latitude and longitude of that tree, take a photo of it, type in what you know about the health of the tree, and create an entire database of this for the city of Cornelius, Oregon. He's 18 and was able to do this through an after school program, but in that documentary about Luis, um, he talks about how he always wanted to have his own computer, but his parents could never afford it. They came from Mexico. Uh, they work as gardeners in the city. And he would always ask his, his parents, you know, can I get this thing? And they'd say, I'm sorry, we don't have enough money for that. He would always go to uh, swap meets on Saturdays with his uncle, look at old computers and try to see if we can get a couple hundred dollars to get one. So through the 4-H program, he was able to get access to this technology. And now he's at the age of 18. Many of these other kids are getting that access much earlier at the age of three or five, so we need to close that gap. Um, well, I, I think it's an exciting time for these young people, and I encourage us to think about ways of creating uh, a new learning system for them that goes far beyond what school systems have been able to provide. We at Edutopia profile all sorts of really exciting places around the country, but they're really just the top 3%, 4%, more than 100,000 schools out there. I don't think we've profiled a couple of thousand schools yet. I'm so please, folks who are here from the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, please, I hope they'll get a chance to talk about what they're doing with uh, uh, portable laptops for kids in, uh, in the Cherokee Nation. Really exciting things. Uh, our challenge is really to bring these to scale, to find the policies and the leaders who will make this happen. I won't in, uh, go into great detail on my speech, but we have managed to politicize learning. We've made it much too political, and we've let the politicians run it. And there aren't enough courageous politicians out there who are willing to say, I want to be in office for four years and make this happen. I want to be in office for eight years and make this happen. Even school board members who are elected are always thinking about the next race, the next election, and therefore they're parsing their words and their policies and their votes in a way that will get them to the next thing. I don't know if this is possible, but I like the approach that Bill Moyers has suggested. Uh, if you look at how we're running elections, campaigns, we've made it into a big, huge business in this country. We've commercialized our democracy. Uh, Bill Moyers said, you know, if, if it's so important to have uh, elected leaders in a democracy, let's not do it and make it into a profession. Let's do it at random. Let's just pick 435 people uh, for two years and make it national service. Congratulations, you've been selected as a new member of the House of Representatives. 
that's your national service instead of going into the armed forces, we're going to send you to Washington, D.C. You'll serve there for two years. Okay, if you want, stay for four years. Uh, but wouldn't we get better policies at our federal government level and our state governments if the legislatures were truly representative? If the, I thought it was 10,000 school boards, someone told me it's 14,000 school boards were chosen based on a random selection of people in the community. Um, somehow we've got to get the politics right. Uh, I've talked with Governor Angus King, former Governor Angus King of Maine, a really courageous politician who ran as an independent when he found out what he would have to do to get the Democratic endorsement. He said, I'm sorry, I'm going to just run as an independent. He did. He was reelected. And during those eight years, he is still the only governor former governor of a state where you can walk into that state in Maine and every middle school student has a laptop computer. That's a very politically risky thing to do. He did it and those Maine students have benefited. They're bringing it to the high school now. And while the rest of us have been debating this for the last five or ten years, technology marches on. This is now so inexpensive to do, cost is no longer a factor. According to Maine, to provide every student, this is the state of Maine. I, th I think Maine is about the size maybe of the Bay Area. Uh, how, how many people live in Maine? Where are we? Um, for the state of Maine, to provide every student with a laptop computer, hardware, software, professional development, very important, broadband access to the Internet, $275 per student per year, the state of Maine. They spend, and we spend, about $150 for a textbook. So think about those economies, and I uh, hope that we'll, uh, out, coming out of this conference, we'll renew our effort to bring this technology to every student. Let's start with California, but uh, importantly, that now's the time to bring this to every kid in the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milton, for that great uh, presentation. In terms of that suggestion you made there at the end, I'm looking at my uh, colleague of children now, Wilma Chan, uh, who's our Vice President of Policy. We both served in the legislature, and you might ask us during the break what we think that, of that idea of picking folks by random. I don't, we work a lot with the uh, legislature and members of Congress today, so I don't want to say anything publicly, but you might be surprised. <laughs> Maybe we can improve things. Um, but thank you, uh, Milton. Um, that was an excellent way to kick this off. And, um, uh, we will have you back at other Children Now conferences, except I think I'm going to opt out of that age quiz in the next a couple of years here. Um, Milton mentioned that he was in grad school here just a, a couple years ago. Um, even if he was here last year, he would not have enjoyed this particular facility because we are the first uh, conference convening uh, here in this room at Stanford, so it's an honor for us all uh, to be here. And in addition to Stanford opening up their uh, uh, great facilities, as you know, many of their professors play uh, leading roles in, in helping change things in this state nationally and internationally, uh, including the person I'm about to uh, introduce, uh, Susanna Loeb from the School of Education, um, has been a great uh, leader on, on education issues in this uh, country. She uh, helped quarterback a major study uh, in terms of needed investment investments and reforms in California education that uh, Children Now is, is working hard to try to enact as a policy basis. Um, and Susanna is a member of our, our academic uh, board of advisors. Um, but we wanted Susanna just to come up and introduce herself. The, the School of Education does a lot of great work in the local community and throughout the country. And we're really proud that uh, we're at Stanford today and wanted her to say a few words of welcome. So Susanna, come on up. Hi. So I'm just here to welcome you. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll prepare what I'm going to say during the introduction parts of this, but it was so interesting that I didn't do that. So, in <laughs> so instead, it's just off the cuff. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work both with children now as part of the uh, studies that we did and the work that we try to continuously do on school finance and governance in California. And I think uh, I love children now because they're, they're just kind of in it for the long haul, trying to figure out how we can change things and how we can pull the, um, the political will together, which is really what we need, and maybe, you know, by 
selecting people randomly that we'd have a better chance of getting the political will. Um, but, but in any case, I would do almost anything they asked me to, <laughs> to do. So uh, we're here for, a, or I was, I got involved in this through Children Now, but also actually through the Future of Children, which um, I edited a volume for, I think in 2007 on teachers. And I'm involved in a whole bunch of different edited volumes. And there has been no experience on an edited volume that I, that I think has been as good as Future of Children. And it's uh, really not just the one that I, I uh, worked on that I look at. There are, there's one on early childhood education that I find I go to continuously when I'm teaching my classes or sending students to, to um, see what's going on in the area, that they have an ability that I think no other organization right now has, which is to kind of get the very best of research. So many of these edited volumes, people are just putting their work in that's not really very good. What, what they do is really get the best of it, and they pull it together at, in a way that's accessible. So in addition to the volume, there's another little brief that goes with it, and then there, there are conferences of practitioners, um, at every level, at the, at the classroom level, the school level, the district level, state level, that come around to talk about these issues. So it's, it's really, again, an organization that, that's different from other organizations out there, and I think one that you should uh, uh, try, to, try to look at the other things they've done, not just the one that we're talking about today, because I think they are just uniformly of high quality. So really, I am just here to, to welcome you. I direct a center called the Institute for Research on Education Policy and Practice at Stanford. And we're relatively new. We started with, with the Getting Down to Facts project on California uh, finance and governance a couple of years ago. And we're hoping to, to build and, and to um, Right now, we're working with a number of districts, San Francisco in particular, on some studies. And uh, we're hoping to uh, hold forums like this in the future. And so keep us in mind. And we're very happy to welcome you and to support this uh, conference today. Thank you.